<clears throat> Oops, I didn't have that transition <laughs> in Good my paper. Everybody. It's a, a pleasure to be here. A huge mm. gratitude to the organizers for the conference, which serves for us, I think, as an annual reminder that democracy and the rules-based system can only be maintained by intention. And if we fail to maintain those precious foundation stones, we risk losing them. Um, as you heard, my name is Luke de Pulford. I'm the executive director of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, IPAC. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of us, just to allow me briefly to introduce our work, IPAC is a cross-party international alliance of legislators working to reform the way democratic governments approach China. So IPAC is basically a, a framing institution. We use the tools available to MPs, not governments, MPs, around the world to shift the debate around China in our respective countries, moving the Overton window to make policy reform on China possible and desirable. Since we were founded, I think we've had some success with this approach. From a humble start with eight democracies, we now have grown to over 30 legislatures with more than 260 legislator members. Beijing doesn't like this. State media calls us the nuisance alliance and has sanctioned 15 of our members which in itself is an indication of the fact that this work is now more important than ever. We are living through a pivotal moment in world history where the foundational principles of the rules-based system are on life support. Instead of defending those principles, many democracies remain blinded by greed and the perceived opportunities offered by the Chinese market, or they remain captured by political narratives. So if I may speak very candidly and boldly, uh, in my view, uh, President Macron is one of them, laboring under the misapprehension that concern with China is just a US problem. Meanwhile, across the Five Eyes, we're now seeing the reintroduction of a two-speed diplomatic approach to Beijing, toning down the public rhetoric in the vain hope that this will de-escalate tensions across the Taiwan Strait while toughening up a little bit quietly. This strategy is a proven failure, and we can see that it will fail again as economic interests take over and use de-escalation as a fig leaf to pursue increased bilateral trade, driving us deeper into dependency and crippling our collective resilience. So the existence of IPAC serves as a reminder that this isn't good enough and that the challenge posed by the rise of the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping is all of our problem. So I'm truly delighted to be joined today by three very courageous MPs from our global network who understand this challenge and refused to be cowed into silence. Uh, we have Eva de Kwa from the Czech Republic with us. We have Lucia Kello who's come all the way from Uganda and we have Davila Shakalien from Lithuania. Please welcome them all. Lucy, if I may, I would love to put a question to you first. Uh, last year, you joined this same summit and you spoke in depth about the struggles in your country that you're facing in regard to navigating Chinese investment and pressures. How would you say your electorate feels about China now? What's important for them? Do you think anything has changed since you were last here? Thank you. It's, it's good to be back. Um, I would describe it in a sentence or a word. It's a bitter, sweet experience for the electorate. And the bigger percentage is the bitterness. And the sweetness is for the top government officials who benefit from the corruption and all the other things. But for the ordinary citizen of Ugandan, they feel the experience is exploitative because of the contracts, the kind of contracts that are signed, they feel their jobs are being taken by the Chinese. They come in the disguise of offering job opportunities, but in essence, the monies are, the Chinese follow their money to Uganda and end up employing their own people. The work environment is not the best for the ordinary Ugandan because we have had cases and cases of a Ugandan being beaten by Chinese, 
and there's nothing that is done to them because they feel they're on top and they do everything with a lot of impunity. So there's a lot of, I would say, bitterness for the ordinary person that I represent. Uh, but because up on top there, they feel, the Chinese feel protected. That's why I said it is a bittersweet kind of relationship, but the bitterness is at 99%, and there 1% is for the top government officials who benefit from this. Thank you very much indeed, Lucy. Going to you, Davila. Um, Lithuanian is, is now seen in some quarters a bit of a beacon of resistance um, against uh, PRC pressure, particularly when it comes to navigating economic coercion. Uh, you yourself are placed on their blacklist, uh, having been personally sanctioned. Have you noticed a shift in public opinion um, in China in recent years within Lithuania? So, um, as I have two minutes, I won't go into long talks and I'll just share some numbers because I think that it is quite interesting how China has completely shattered its cover as a peaceful power oriented only towards uh, mutual economic gain yeah. in just months, whereas two decades of economic coercion towards dozens of countries hasn't done that because, well, we didn't forget what was happening for two decades. Yet, last year was crucial and I have some data uh, of survey which was completed in August 2022, mm -hmm. which shows that, for example, 41% of people in Lithuania have changed their opinion on China for the worse, compared with 34% average in 13 European Union countries. So even though in Lithuania there was not much support for the governmental position regarding China in the beginning, now we see that the numbers are growing. Thank you, China. And also, when we look at partnership of China to Russia, then this was the key factor for 79% of Lithuanians, four out of five, for them to worsen their opinion on China. And by the, way, by the way, for me, it was interesting that more than half Lithuanians condemn Chinese actions toward Uyghurs, and almost half feel the same of China's effort to take control of Taiwan. So what we see is that 16% would even like tougher position of our government regarding that. And in case of China's partnership with Russia, one out of four, 25% of Lithuanians would like even stronger stance from our government. So I think China and Russia was a tandem which kind of, well, broke down the illusions that world had about them. But to my own surprise, the highest support in our society is towards Chinese sanctions against me and other UMPs. I mean, 61% Lithuanians are not happy about this step of China, and 36% support government's position, and 26% want even stronger stance. I think it's actually, what is really interesting is that every second Lithuanian believe that government should take measures to counteract that sanctioning of MPs. I think that shows that China really made a mistake in that. Yeah. But what I think is also important to know is that um, 45% also believe that government should take measures, almost half in regard to Uyghurs, treatment of Uyghurs, and 56%, even more, feel that government should take measures in regard to Chinese attempts to take over Taiwan. And also, this is also the same number as people feel that our government should take actions in China's partnership with Russia. So what it says to us, that Taiwan has become much more important to Lithuanians, and in this case, it's almost the same when they look at Russian aggression towards Ukraine and the threats of China towards Taiwan. So it makes me wonder also how much support China also has lost after its ambassador in France questioned sovereignty and independence of the Baltic states. We didn't take it very well in Lithuania, believe me. So I think more and more people see Russia and China both for what they are, genocidal empires threatening their neighbors and do not respect the global world order. Yeah. Eva, let me come to you. Now, Czechia has recently been very outspoken regarding China's authoritarian pressures, and we've just heard extraordinarily eloquently from your new president. You joined an IPAC delegation recently to Taiwan. Why do you think it's important for parliamentarians to go there? 
You know, maybe I will start with something uh, which was partly said uh, by Mr. President, uh, and uh, it's really proudness for the Czech people uh, to be here uh, to listen to the president. Uh, when you remember uh, how it was uh, several years ago, uh, so we are going from pro-Chinese uh, to this really strict position. But uh, imagine one small country somewhere uh, with a big neighbor country with a uh, 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 taste uh, to grow and to take, uh, and uh, I'm not speaking about Taiwan, I'm speaking about Czech Republic. We had the same experience. And it was something, uh, when I grew up, uh, it was something very often I heard from my parents, from my generation, because in our case, the occupation at the first time, it was political occupation at uh, 1948, uh, after if the, it was army occupation. It lasted for 30 years. So for us, uh, the situation of Taiwan, of this small country with this big neighboring uh, uh, country uh, trying to uh, the Russian, they call it brotherly aid and 68. Mm. Now uh, they call it, uh, the Chinese, they call it unification. It's still the same. The story is the same. So already with this story, uh, for me to go to Taiwan and to see the people there, how they live, this, this situation, it's very important. But uh, in my case, I was not the first parliamentary uh, uh, going to Taiwan. Before me, our Speaker of Senate, Mr. Mr. Chill, he was there uh, in 2020, and uh, there is a famous speech uh, he gave uh, in the parliamentary union uh, saying, I'm Taiwanese. It was uh, a reference uh, to what was said uh, in Berlin. And this is something why the parliamentary I'm going to Taiwan in order to express the friendship, because uh, very often as people uh, in, with the countries is the same. You go somewhere, uh, if uh, it's your friend, you will not uh, visit uh, your neighbor if you don't like him. So to go there, it's the expression of the friendship. Uh, this year it was uh, Mrs. Pekarova, the speaker of, uh, of uh, other lower uh, chamber. Uh, she said that uh, our countries are the closest friends and if we put it in the global framework, uh, uh, I think here we know uh, all of us that uh, the isolation of Taiwan is proposed by China. This is something they really want. So in order, our fact that we go there and we express friendship and uh, that we make a blockade to this, uh, to this isolation, this is very important. And uh, it's not this is this political level, but uh, for us, uh, as for Taiwan, of course, this, this, these visits have also concrete impact uh, for our policy, because uh, during the last visit, uh, there were, I think, at about uh, 11 memorandum concerning uh, business, concerning even army, concerning chips. Uh, so this is something uh, important for our economy, for Taiwan, Taiwanese economy as well. Thank you. OK, well, as you all know, uh, we negotiated an, an IPAC statement on the G7 communique, um, following on from uh, a lot of negotiation with Japanese ministers and others. What would be your message for those who are going to be meeting later on in this week in Hiroshima? What would you like to see in that communique to try to address some of the issues around China? I'll come to you first, Lucy. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, my strong message on behalf of Africa is in line with uh, supply chain and uh, asking the members of the G7 to approach all these issues and reduce the dependency syndrome. You know, it was very, very interesting to learn that almost the whole world came to a standstill as a result of the supply just as a very simple example, wheat coming from, you know, Russia. And yet Africa, if empowered, would have actually, you know, done a lot, even produced wheat, which could have helped the whole of Africa, um, the whole world. Uh, another thing is in terms of, you know, infrastructure. 
When you look the, at the infrastructure in Africa, we just, we, you, you just dot the slave, the slave road patterns which are there, and they're not the best. So I encourage the G7 members to look deeply into investing more in the infrastructure that is in Africa, the road infrastructure, not just to be interested in taking away minerals from Africa and reintroducing what I call neocolonialism, which is even worse. Yeah. Build infrastructure, strengthen Africa, not just giving us. We don't want a situation where we are begging all the time. We want to, to stand on our own. And you know, Africa is such a big block, but we have ended up at the receiving end and begging, as opposed to being on the table and discussing some of these things and negotiating these things on the table and saying, these are the things that are priority to us, not just giving us and giving us all the time. So for me, this is my strong message to, you know, to G7 as they meet, and I hope they take this uh, very seriously. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so Eva, G7 Communique, what should be in it? But considering that uh, I spoke already about Taiwan and uh, considering also the fact that the Czech Republic has really very close relationship, so I will also, my recommendation or my hope will concern also Taiwan. And uh, I think it was said already by Mr. President, I cannot say it in a better way, to really stay united and to really refuse any kind of change or unilateral change uh, of the situation uh, in the uh, South uh, China Sea or uh, Taiwan Strait. Uh, and notwithstanding how uh, China will call it, if they will call it unification, uh, I think uh, let's keep in mind that any change, uh, if it's done by a political means uh, or by military means, uh, it's still something not wanted as of today by Taiwanese. This is one thing. And the other one, let's also keep in mind that uh, it may happen that we will not be able to, uh, to really impeach China to, to make this change. So we should be ready in such case to make really a, a army support of Taiwan. You know, uh, Today we, uh, we heard uh, from uh, Mr. Stoltenberg, uh, I, th I think quite evasive uh, answer. Uh, we hope that there will be peace, but we don't know what we will do, or, or at least I didn't hear it. So I think we should be aware that it may happen. And uh, if we were very long concerning support of Ukraine, we should be very quick concerning support of Taiwan. And uh, because it's not only about Taiwan, but of course at fir first place, it's their democracy, it's their at least internal sovereignty, but it's our interest as well, because uh, all the supply chain uh, are, are concerned, so uh, we will be touched, uh, I think, uh, in several days uh, if something happens. Uh, uh, in Taiwan Strait. So uh, I hope, and I know that it was already declared in the many declaration, but uh, I think in this case, uh, it's important to repeat it, to really have a stronger and stronger support uh, concerning this issue. It should not be forgotten uh, because of the other issues. Thank you. Um, so David, finally coming to you, and perhaps with uh, an angle on the conflict you're so close to, um, the war in Europe at the moment from the vantage point of Lithuania. What would you like to see reflected in the G7 communique? Well, I think that the message is loud and clear. Do not make the same mistake with China as you have made with Russia. Because Beijing's and Moscow's friendship with no limits actually means friendship with no borders. Because we do not respect borders of other states. We do not respect their sovereignty, their identity and their independence. And when, uh, well, most of the West, I'm sorry, but sold their soul for energy to Russia, please do not sell your soul for energy to China. It's really costly then to wage big wars. And we all understand that, well, dictators, when they wage threats, they usually tend to implement them. Mm -hmm. And when uh, Mr. Xi, when meeting Mr. Putin, said that they are going to rearrange the global world order, and that world is going to see things that we haven't seen for a hundred years. 
Well, I suggest you take that very seriously because they are going to threaten global security further. And also I suggest to look very closely about the next steps of Beijing, because it is supporting Moscow in invasion to Ukraine in its bloody genocidal invasion, because unprecedented uh, purchases of Russian energy has just filled the war machine with money. So let's not overlook the possibility that military support is also hanging in the air. Because if we omit that, if we miss that, the price is going to be very steep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, so moving on to your questions in the remaining time that we have, we have a, a question here. Um, what significant legislative achievements have the members made individually, domestically, that they can offer as an example for other legislators. Um, now, there are lots of these, so I might again pick on you, Davida, because I know you did one of these. Um, IPAC passed lots of motions in lots of different parliaments to try to recognize atrocities against the Uyghur minority in northwest China. Perhaps, Davida, you could talk to us about what you did in Lithuania to recognize the Uyghur genocide. So in February 2021, I suggested to my committee, I'm a National Security and Defense Committee the second term, and my colleagues at Foreign Affairs Committees, who usually overlook the motions, to have a joint meeting and suggested initiative on a resolution acknowledging Uyghur genocide. So uh, after we had second meeting where this was approved and uh, the finalization of this text started, I was sanctioned by People's Republic of China, it really helped. And then the resolution was passed in May with a landslide vote. So I'm really grateful for that. Bravo. Hey. But if I may add, actually, about legislation, I think it's really important to protect your critical infrastructure. And we started from stopping Huawei from going into 5G networks to uh, preventing them from investment in our strategic infrastructure and critical infrastructure. So this is quite simple, actually, if you understand what is at stake. And I think Africa is a terrible example what happens when they put a noose over your neck with debts for the things that actually break down after, as Lucy said, first rainfall, the bridge is gone but with that you still have to pay. Thank you very much. Um, there are many more examples, but there's another interesting question here that I want to pose to you, Lucy. Um, are we, the democratic world, partly responsible for the Chinese authoritarian regime's success? After all, it was Western cooperation's economic incentives that moved production to China. So perhaps you could uh, address that. Are we responsible? <laughs> well, uh, I will say yes. And my president always says those those Americans, those Europeans, they are not good people. The Chinese are good people. And like I said the other time, are they really good people? No, they are not. But they come in disguise. They, they make it seem like so good. They make the contracts, everything seem so nice. And I compared them to how a rat behaves. And uh, because at the end of the day, just like uh, my colleague said here, we get these monies, which seem very harmless, because it is so easy to get it from China, very easy. And yet the West would make it so difficult, difficult in quotes, and I'm putting difficult in quotes, because they're saying, okay, um, are you torturing people? Because you're torturing people in Uganda, we are not giving you this. So there's a checklist, the human rights checklist, which oftentimes we fail. And as a result, they go for the soft one. Because the Chinese are ready to give any amount of money as long as you are able to part with a little. And there's so much corruption. Right now, my country is suffering from the backlash of the majority of the works that has been done by Chinese state enterprises, you know, state-operated state enterprises, building the roads, they are the ones building the bridges. Now the bridges have been washed down by the rains, the heavy rains, and we have to go back and reconstruct those roads, reconstruct these bridges. At what cost? Low cost, simply thinking that it was easier to get it from China. I have always said here, we need to go back on the drawing board, dialogue, Yes, we will need China, but we need to make it, we need, we need to make stringent, 
you know, um, contracts with them, we need to make it very clear that we cannot just receive everything. We cannot receive something simply because it is, it is bad. Finally, if I can just conclude on this. There was a story of a village child who was putting on a boy who was putting on high heel shoes and one who was putting on a night pyjama and went with it to the party. Because these are free things and they receive it. Because they don't have clothes, they will put the pyjama and go with it to the party. The boy will put on a high heel and go with it and he thinks he's the smartest. And this is exactly what we are, what we are going through in Africa. We are receiving this thinking is cheap, but it is actually very, very expensive. Would rather go through the long procedure and get the right things and at the end of the day get a better deal than getting cheap but a wrong deal. So I think, yes, the West is also responsible for this and uh, we need to go back to the drawing board. Like I said always, China makes it very easy. Everything is easy. The visa is easy. Um, they have all categories of prices. The one meant for Africa, the one meant for uh, Europe, the one for, Af uh, for America. So the ones for Africa, very cheap. I go, do business, come back. It's very difficult to do business with the West. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. And particularly interested to hear about how aid conditionality from the West seems to pave the way to Chinese investment, which seems so much easier from the vantage point of African countries. I think that's extremely interesting. Um, I, I'm going to pose the final question to you, Eva, which has just come in. It's quite a difficult one and a sad one. Uh, how do you see Hong Kong now? Is it a lost battle? Uh, I think we cannot answer yes. Because uh, if we answer yes, uh, we, it's, uh, uh, of course we have to battle. Of course the, the situation is not easy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this is uh, fair to admit. Uh, so uh, I will use uh, this forum also as a kind of pressure. I'm a, I'm a member of the country. We still have extradition treaty with Hong Kong. And it's very difficult sometimes from political point of view to change it. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, Hong Kong is in a difficult situation, but uh, I would even say uh, that uh, it's difficult to compare today Hong Kong and Taiwan. I think uh, Asia and all the countries are being uh, under potential or real threat or uh, taste of China are in difficult situation. So uh, uh, I would answer uh, maybe uh, by reaction also to Lucy uh, uh, with China, uh, it is uh, something uh, like what we read uh, in the fairy tales. Do you remember? It was very easy to sign with the evil. Mm. It was uh, nice, uh, the evil was nice, it was quick, uh, and in the moment you did not realize what you're signing. Uh, and we, uh, European, uh, we are building a very uh, difficult uh, bureaucratic and political stuff, uh, but we need uh, now to explain uh, to some countries uh, and sometimes also to our colleagues. Uh, because uh, here I think and I suppose that uh, we're all together, we will be uh, very like-minded, uh, but we have to explain uh, very often that this easy money, uh, this uh, easy supply chain from China is signing to evil. Thank you. Well, well, well that's um, our time up. I think I might just uh, abuse the floor um, and moderate this position here to say very briefly from the perspective of the Secretariat in IPAC and from many of the politicians in IPAC, uh, we won't be giving up on Hong Kong, uh, that's for sure. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you to my panelists and look forward to seeing you here again soon. It was